Hey guys, welcome to the session by IntelliPart. Ethical hacking is such an important career to have in today's world, right? Everything is online, your private information, personal information, be it financial information, a lot of things are online, be it if you're an individual or even if you own a business. This calls for a never ending demand and supply of, uh, you know, professional certified ethical hackers out there, right? So keeping that in mind, we here at IntelliPart have come up with this ethical hacking top interview uh, questions and answers set to help you guys have an edge in your interviews because with this top career role comes a lot of competition and we hope with this video that uh, you know you can make the best use out of it and ace your interviews as well. Before we begin with this session guys make sure to hit that subscribe button and that bell icon so that you will never miss any updates from us. Uh, coming to the agenda of the session we'll be covering a lot about encryption we'll be checking out what an ethical hacker does uh, you know, what are the top tools that are used, top techniques, what is encryption, uh, uh, you know, there's many, many concepts that we're checking out in this particular video. So make sure to have a pen and paper handy and, uh, you know, just work with the video. And also guys, if you're looking to become experts in ethical hacking and cybersecurity, make sure to check out the IntelliPath's ethical hacking and uh, cybersecurity course made in collaboration with the EC Council. There should be a link in the description box, so make sure to check that out. Well guys, without further ado, let's start the class now. Coming to the first question on the stop ethical hacking interview questions and answers set, it states what are the advantages and disadvantages of hacking? Well, we're talking about the general term of hacking here and if you're wondering about are there even any sort of advantages to it? Well, yes, that's the entire point of ethical hacking, right? So one of the most important advantages is that it can be used as a way to ensure that, you know, uh, you can fix all the bugs and the loopholes that are present in the system and at the end of the day if you do fix all of this it means that it will not allow actual hackers to create a nuisance by accessing your data in an unauthorized way and a lot more and of course if you yourself are hacking into your company in an ethical manner to test the security features it means that when an actual hacker does uh, try to get in that he or she will fail therefore it will prevent data theft and of course uh, any sort of malicious attacks can be kept at bay as well but now, the disadvantages of hacking in an unethical way uh, talks about massive security issues because, uh, you know, at the end of the day, it's illegal. The second thing is that you can have unauthorized system access, which is not recommended. And uh, stealing private information can become very easy. And of course, violating privacy regulations can get out of hand as well. So when you ask this question in the interview, make sure to talk about both the advantages and the disadvantages of ethical and unethical hacking as well. Coming to question number two, uh, it states what what is the difference between uh, asymmetric and symmetric encryption? Well, whenever we talk about asymmetric encryption, one important thing you really have to know is that it lies in the name. So with asymmetric encryption, what we're trying to do is we're having different keys for encryption purposes. And of course, there's another different key for decryption purposes. But in the case of symmetric encryption, as the name suggests, both the keys that's used to encrypt and decrypt are exactly the same. And then another important point is that uh, with uh, asymmetric encryption, right, it's, it's really powerful, it's more secure but it is very slow to implement in real life. So whenever someone talks about implementing just asymmetric encryption, it's always recommended to take a hybrid approach to find the best way, the fastest way possible. And then when we talk about symmetric, of course, when you directly compare it to asymmetric encryption, it's pretty fast. It's, it's actually really fast, but then the key needs to be transferred over an unencrypted channel, which could, uh, you know, lead to some sort of deficiencies and that could lead uh, to potential hack as well. So if your product is time sensitive and if you really like uh, having security on the go then you would be using symmetric encryption but if you'd prefer to take more time out of your day then of course asymmetric encryption is more secure and that's the way to go coming to question number three uh, it says how can you avoid ARP poisoning well, uh, ARP poisoning is one of these types of network attack that can uh, make or break a product, right? So uh, either you're trying to protect a website, you're trying to protect a brand, a product, whatever it is that you're doing, once you are, you know, victim to this, things go really out of hand. So how can you avoid ARP poisoning? There are three main ways to do this. One is by making use of what we call as packet filtering. What packet filtering does is that it filters out and blocks all the packets which actually clash with all the source address data that's coming in to make 
make sure that all the incoming sources are continuously tracked and monitored and the second thing is that you can keep away from trust relationships right see organizations have to develop protocols and you know the dependency on trust has to really be as little as possible because at the end of the day you will never know when trust is broken between uh, two organizations right so keeping that in mind a uh, protocol over trust relationships is something that i would definitely recommend and when you're thinking about uh, utilizing arp spoofing softwares right because uh, there are programs out there that have the capability to assess and certify the information completely and check for its validity of course before transmitting it right so this information you can have complete control of you can spoof the information you can block it you can uh, send in an entirely different information that's spoofing and you know you can do a lot of things with these uh, arp spoofing software that will make sure uh, that you know you do not you know you can avoid arp poisoning basically coming to question number 4 it says what can an ethical hacker do well this is a very generic question uh, you know very simple question with a very specific answer so basically uh, do not get carried away keep your answer very concise so an ethical hacker what he or she does is that uh, they are a person who is completely capable and proficient at working with computers and thoroughly experts in networking because at the end of the day they use all of this skill and technique that they have to infiltrate either a network or an environment or a website or whatever it is. is to make sure that you know they do it so that actual hackers don't so they do it they report what the vulnerabilities are there to the security team the security team fixes all of that to make sure that you know an actual hacker will not exploit that and have an authorized access so it's a way of uh, the company hacking itself and or hiring a person to do it for them to show vulnerabilities such that they can fix it and prevent unauthorized access so coming to question number 5 it says why is python utilized for hacking one important thing you really have to know about python is that it's used literally everywhere be it artificial intelligence be it web development game development hacking whatever you think about uh, you know python is there right similarly in the case of hacking as well here uh, it's, it's a widely used scripting language for hackers uh, especially in today's world of uh, trending programming languages and scripting languages and uh, you know it has some very nice features that makes it very important for hacking it has so many libraries that it comes with and this intense kind of functionality that python provides right so you will have to do very little to get a huge output so keeping that in mind it always is an added advantage for a hacker so as minimal as you do but having a result which is pretty big so comparing all of this and comparing how powerful python is by itself followed by all the libraries the modules the functionality it provides it is definitely one of the reasons uh, why python is utilized for hacking now coming to question number 6 it states what is farming and what is defacement Well when we talk about farming right so farming is one of the strategies where uh, the attacker who's planning an attack will compromise the DNS DNS basically stands for domain name system and these servers are completely compromised on the user PC so what this does is that there is a goal where traffic is completely directed from uh, the site of requirement towards a malicious site so so farming literally means compromising the DNS to move traffic away from the actual site into a malicious site too now coming to defacement right so defacement is one of these other strategies is where the hacker actually completely attacks the firm's website and then changes the entire contents of the website with something else so you might have uh, you know hackers names images or some messages background music videos or whatever it that didn't belong to the original owner so that right so all of those details are uh, you know considered in defacement so changing the entirety of the website could be one of the things the content of the website how the website works does the website work or not at all so all of these things come under defacement and farming too so coming to question number 7 uh, it's it's what is cuff party well cuff party is one of these offline dictionary attacks that takes place especially over a wpa or wpa2 networks by making use of uh, you know the psk based verification that we have uh, when you can think of an example you know wp wpa personal is something that will succumb to cuff party as well so whenever dictionary attacks are considered right for example like uh, cuff party here what we trying to do is we trying to uh, have an enhanced attack to see if uh you know there is a computed pmk document that is available for the ssid that we are trying to uh, you know assess to see if we can attack or not if that's the case then of course uh, you know the attack take place so this is basically an offline dictionary attack and it is as simple and straightforward as that coming to question number 8 uh, it says what is network enumeration well network enumeration is one of those revelations that happens to gadgets and uh, hosts on a network so what's basically happening is that they tend to utilize all the obvious disclosure protocols right so when 
you can think of an example, think about ICMP and think about SNMP and how they gather data. So even though on the front, they may look like it works similarly, but uh, there's a lot of different things that happen. They check different ports on remote you know, hosts, right? So what we're trying to do here is we're trying to have known services to use, but we're trying to further recognize what's happening with the remote host. What's the function of this remote host and how it's working as well. So to understand all of this, to get a better idea of the gadget or the host in the network to see if uh, you know, any sort of data can be obtained from it. That is basically network enumeration. Question number nine uh, states, distinguish between phishing and spoofing. Uh, well, phishing and spoofing, as the name suggests, actually are very different uh, underneath the surface, even though they seem uh, very similar on the top. Let's say one person goes on to download a malware on their PC or let's say on their network, right? And the other part so one actually, you know, phishing, you can consider to be an example of having a malware downloaded on your PC or a network. And the other part is that you can uh, you can give monetary data to a person who is a scammer online and all of that. And this all of it alongside, uh, you know, uh, a delivery of this kind of a malicious software to your PC, that's spoofing taking money from you, right? Gathering something for recovery purposes, that's phishing. Spoofing involves a method of delivery uh, into your network or into your machine, but phishing always talks about uh, taking something away or, or recovering something from your PC in an unauthorized way. That's the basic difference between phishing and spoofing. Question number 10 states, what is network sniffing? See, uh, whenever we talk about sniffing, right, it's usually system sniffing that comes into picture because here we're trying to use all the tools to make sure we can have the capabilities to monitor, assess and analyze what is going on with the PC system that we are sniffing on. So sniffing is this kind of an illegal access over a machine where you have all the details and all the control out of it. So you can either steal data, you can make use of its processing power or a lot more things. Now, when the same thing happens over a network, we call it as network sniffing because here, uh, you know, there's two cases that we do sniffing one can be for ethical purposes and the other one of course is unethical purposes right so system admins what they do is they make use of all of this tools be it analytics or uh, be it uh, system monitoring as well this is done to make sure we can avoid any sort of uh, traffic bottlenecks that happen and we analyze and assess every single state this is one way of uh, utilizing it ethically but network sniffing illegally is when you know you can uh, utilize uh, and you know you can sneak in softwares which are untrustworthy and of course at the end of the day you can uh, pick up a lot of uh uh, uh, you know, scrupulous information such as uh, email IDs, delicate information. You can hijack the machine. You can uh, have a lot of personal details, intrude privacy and a lot more. So this is network sniffing. Coming to question number 11, it states, what do you mean by DOS or DOS? What are the regular types of DOS? Assault? Well, DOS actually stands for denial of service. It's one of the most malicious attack that takes place. It's a pretty common attack that gets executed on, on a network or a system that's present. So what do we usually do? with DOS is that we flood the entire system with traffic that is absolutely meaningless or we can consider it to be useless as well. So all of this inrush of traffic so what it does is that it will take your entire network and it will crash it out. So when that happens, right, of course, it's going to cost you time and money. And there are many, many types of DOS attacks that take place. You know, you have the buffer overflow attack, you have sin attacks, teardrops, smurfing. And of course, you have viruses as the general form of DOS as well. So when you are uh, a denial of service, literally is that you'll be breaching and you'll be flooding system with traffic to make sure you halt whatever is going there. And that whatever system it's there or whatever network it's there, it will not be able to provide service anymore. More. That is how the name came about, literally calling it denial of service. Coming to question number 12, uh, it's, it's what do you understand by footprinting in ethical hacking and what are the techniques used for footprinting? One thing you need to know about footprint is that it's a very simple thing. Uh, you know, it's about accumulating, it's about revealing as much as information, as much as data possible, even before we gain access into the network that we're going to. It's almost like assessing without having complete access over it. The techniques that are very popular are basically open source footprinting. We have scanning, network enumeration and stack fingerprinting. So when we talk about the open source footprinting, uh, you know, here what we're trying to do is we're trying to search for all the contact data of the administrators, uh, you know, that we try to uh, maybe guess for the password and social engineering. We understand, uh, you know, we can try in a couple of passwords considering their name, their phone number, their email to see if any of those work. 
and then we have network enumeration network enumeration is basically our attempt to distinguish the domain names and to see how they differ from the network blocks that are present in the target traffic as well then we have scanning with scanning what we try to do is that once we know that the network that we want to attack the second thing is to check all the ip addresses that are connected on the network and then to spy on them right so to distinguish the active ip addresses uh, you know we use icmp which is basically the internet control message protocol and that will act as the functioning ip address it will reveal a lot of details that you can use even before uh, you know you hack into the system or in fact you can use those details to hack or breach the system as well coming to stack fingerprinting so this is basically the final stage of what happens uh, you know in a footprinting uh, step is executed because what we are trying to do here is that you know once you know the host once you know the port once you have mapped everything by completely understanding the network uh, once you have all of the details that is when you you have reached the stage of stack fingerprinting because uh, here you you completely have an idea of what's going on what what hosts what ports how they are mapped how they can be breached and it's basically a plan of action so all of these you know, techniques can be used and implemented to perform footprinting coming to question number 13 it's a very simple or uh, difference uh, question it states what is the difference between encryption and hashing see encryption and hashing both are pretty similar when you think about it on paper but at the end of the day there's a lot of differences as well but the most simple difference is uh, you know you can get carried away with this question i really suggest you keep it very concise because uh, as an ethical hacker there's a good chance that you should know about encryption and hashing right so when we talk about encryption the main differences lie in reversibility and irreversibility right so when you encrypt data you can decrypt it later by using a cipher or a key but whenever you're hashing something hashing is to totally irreversible right there's no way to go to the source uh, once you have the product that's one important difference the second difference is what encryption always talks about is how you can have confidence over your data about your network and about your product but what hashing talks about is of course confidentiality is prime in hashing as well but it makes sure that integrity uh, of your data uh, is true that nothing can be beaten it cannot be uh, uh, you know messed around with so depending on that moment whatever is more important right be it data integrity or data confidentiality you would go on to pick one of these two methodologies or sometimes they go hand in hand too now coming to question number 14 uh, it says what is the cia triangle cia is basically uh, an acronym that stands for confidentiality integrity and availability with confidentiality we talk about how the information can be kept secret first of all to make sure that you know people do not get access to it who are unauthorized when we talk about integrity here all we are trying to do is we are making sure that the information that is present cannot be altered unless uh, it is authorized so it means keeping the information un unaltered or at the time and then when we are talking about availability availability or talks about both confidentiality and integrity in a way that you know the data is only available to authorized parties and not someone who doesn't have access to the data so keeping your uh, data secret keeping it unaltered and keeping it uh, only accessible to authorized parties is all about the cia triangle or uh, you know what we call as the confidentiality integrity and the availability triangle as well Now coming to question number 15 uh, it says what is the difference between vulnerability assessment and penetration testing so vulnerability assessment can also be called as va and penetration testing can also be called as pt or pen testing uh, for that matter so if you are asked this question in multiple ways do know that they are the same So what we talk about vulnerability assessment is that it is one of these approaches that we use to find flaws that is present uh, either in an application or a network right so it's all about uh, think of an approach like you're traveling on the surfaces hunting for things that you can pick up it's almost like uh, uh, you know it's, it's it's an overview of what you can assess and uh, what you can pick up now with penetration testing uh, you know we'll find all of the vulnerabilities in the vulnerability assessment stage and uh, here we try to find uh, you know all the vulnerabilities like how an actual hacker would do and perform all of those as well so it can be uh, considered as the analogy to digging for gold rather than traveling on the surface so you know you'll be digging deeper you'll be trying to actually get uh you know get into the system and break through as well so that is the basic difference between vulnerability assessment and penetration testing coming to question number 16 uh it says what is a firewall 
Well, firewall as the name suggests is probably the most important thing whenever we talk about uh, network security or whenever we talk about ethical hacking, right? Because this is either a device or a piece of software that we use to make sure that we can allow uh, traffic, we can block traffic or we can, uh, you know, uh, monitor the traffic in detail based on a couple of rules. So all of these are usually placed either uh, inside the network or just on the boundary or outside the network or in fact all of those at a time as well. So whenever you know this goes on firewall is basically inside the system whenever it's present it's usually based on to provide access uh, specifiers and access methodologies to the people inside the company when it's placed at the boundary of trusted and untrusted networks it is trying to monitor the incoming and the outgoing traffic and when it's outside the network what it's trying to do is it's trying to analyze and assess for potential hacking scenarios as well Coming to question number 17, uh, it says what is data leakage and how will you detect data leakage and how will you prevent it of course. Data leakage as the name suggests means that data is going out of your organization without you knowing it or even if you have no knowledge over it, there's a very good chance uh, you know someone can misuse the data right. So that's one very important thing. So to detect data leakage, right, you have many, many things. And first of all, to detect it, you have to understand where it's going through. Uh, you have a lot of things, right? You can have printouts, you can have laptops, uh, lost and found items. You can have emails, unauthorized data to public portals. You can have pen drives, you can have pictures. So there are multiple ways through which data can go out of an organization. Uh, you know, for each of these, of course, you will have to cater to individual solutions to make sure that, you know, uh, let's say things that you cannot upload on websites, you cannot uh, put in pen drives, uh, into uh, you know your organization's uh, laptops as well or let's say you cannot have an unmonitored email that goes out of your network you cannot print confidential information there's so many things depending on the organization that you can do to make sure that data leakage is prevented and then coming on to the 18th question it states what are the hacking stages what are the step-by-step -step methods uh, through which hacking takes place explain each stage See, hacking or whenever you're targeting any sort of machine actually happens in five important phases. The first step is surveillance. Surveillance is the first step where we're trying to analyze, uh, where we're trying to gather as much data, we're trying to perform vulnerability assessment, we're trying to understand the target as much as possible by getting details, uh, you know, in a, in a very detailed and in-depth way. And then after we uh, do surveillance, we do scanning. Scanning involves, uh, you know, trying to go through the data that you've collected to see if you can find any sort of causality. Because once you find causality, there is a very good chance you can use all the uh, computerized uh, tools that you have, uh, all of the softwares where uh, you can, you know, have port scanners, port mappers, vulnerability scanners, and you can use all of these tools to see if you can find a way in and then getting access right so this is where the actual hacking happens because this is where the hacker actually gets into your machine uh, through all of the data that's obtained from surveillance and scanning and actually gets uh, into the network so this is the step that you will get hacked through and of course after that uh, once the hacker has access uh, into the computer or into the network they, 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 they must make sure that you know they, they keep access no matter what right so they can have future exploitations future assaults uh, you know you can have backdoors you can have have rootkits, you can have trojans, you can have a lot of ways that the hacker can continuously come back and monitor and in fact hold access as well. That's the simple step of access maintenance. And then covering tracks, right? So once hackers have got all the stuff that they need to do, what they do, they have to do is they have to maintain access and they have to keep away from getting detected, right? If, if a hacker is detected in a system, it means that the company or the network or whatever, you know, is going on will find that out. So you have to cover your tracks every single way. You have to keep it in a way that, you know, it's basically tiptoeing through a network is what we call, uh, you know, to make sure that you are undetected yet you have unauthorized access. Now coming to question number 19, it states, what are the tools used for ethical hacking? Well, again, this is a very generic questions where you can uh, where you can get carried away. So make sure you're keeping it concise when you're answering this. Uh, understand that there's many, many, many tools that you can uh, use, especially in the case of ethical hacking or what we call as moral hacking as well. But there you are know, many purposes that you can uh, have a result towards if you are uh, using these tools. For example, we have Nmap. Nmap actually stands for Network Plotters. So what Network Plotters is that you know it's an open source tool that's basically used for uh, security auditing and and the, and the purpose of network 
network discovery and the and then you have metasploit metasploit is one of the most popular one of the most powerful exploit tool out there uh, which you can use to perform basic pen testing and after that we have burp suit burp suit is one of these big really big platforms that exist today because this is where we're trying to use and try to see if we can play around with the security testing of uh, all the applications that are present on the internet and then you have angry ip scanner so here what we're trying to do is it's uh, one of these lightweight cross-platform information processing uh, tool that is uh, basically used to assess ports and addresses so we can scan and get all the details as required and of course we have cane enable cane enable is a popular password recovery tool with all the microsoft operational systems out there so ETCAP is one of these uh, uh, network capture modules. It actually stands for local area network capture and it is used for man in the middle attacks that we perform, especially, uh, you know, whenever we go on to uh, perform attacks after the stage of network security. So uh, these are some of the really, really popular tools in ethical hacking. And do understand that there's a lot more tools. You do not have to just state these that are present on the screen. You do have leeway to talk about the tools that you might have used and of course how you have used them as well. Coming to question number 20, uh, it says, what is Mac flooding? Mac flooding, as the name suggests, is one of these other techniques that we make use of whenever we require any sort of protection, whenever, uh, you know, a network switch is actually compromised. So here in Mac flooding, what happens is that the hacker actually floods the network switch completely with huge amounts of data, of which is, of course, definitely more than what the switch can handle. So what the switch does at the end of the day when it, when it can when it sees a lot more data that it can handle is it, it becomes a hub and it starts transmitting every single packet over every single open port that exists. So doing this means that it is literally giving the hacker a highway to steam through uh, to the uh, you know to attempt to send his or her packet into the network and steal uh, whatever information is required as well. So think about it like a dam and think about sending in so much water that the dam floods open and the water is let out, right? similar analogy here as well and in fact that's one of the reasons why uh, it, it has the name mac flooding too coming to question number 21 it says explain how you can stop your website from being hacked Again, uh, you know, this is a general question. So make sure uh, always never to get carried away, never to start your answers with stories. Keep it very concise. And that's what I would recommend as well. So to make sure your website doesn't get hacked, always make sure you're using a firewall because if you have a firewall, it means that it can drop all the traffic that's coming in from suspicious uh, processing addresses. You know, uh, if you do not have a firewall, you know, you can easily uh, be open to a DOS attack and then you can encrypt all the cookies that come in and come out because uh, you can have session points and cookie poisonings that can happen and using uh, the encryption of cookies what you can do is you can prevent all of this because at the end of the day what you're trying to do is you're associating cookies with the consumer information you can have a lot of uh, arrangement that's made right so once you get the cookie to be slow once you get the cookie uh, to be encrypted you can you can work with it easily and then you are validating and confirming the user input because this is a place where you can uh, stop the type tampering that gets happened whenever a user is confirmative and verifying the data uh, you know before processing that as well so this is one of the most important things especially whenever uh, you're working on your website security and then of course we have the header sanitization and validation so, so here what we're trying to do is we're actually beneficial against cross website scripting be it xss or any other types of uh, methodologies that involve you know verifying and uh, sanitizing headers we're trying to pass the uh, parameters over via the addresses type parameters hidden values and everything so all of this is at the end of the day done to make sure we can be safe against xss attacks as as well so these are some of the steps that you can use to stop your website from being hacked but at the end of the day does it completely stop that is subjective but depending on rather having uh, either none or everything of these i would really prefer having uh, you know everything of these as well so coming to question number 22 it says what is burp suit what are the other tools that it contains as we already discussed previously, Burp Suit, this could be a follow-up question to that. Burp Suit is an integrated platform that we use for attacking, uh, you know, the uh, applications present on the internet. It contains a lot of tools. In fact, it contains a plethora of tools that a hacker would require to hack into any applications, right? So think about the functionality. You have the proxy, you have spider, you have a scanner, you have intruders, you have repeaters, decoders, comparers, sequences, and you, know, you can literally go on and on uh, whenever you talk about Burp Suit. And, it, and in this question is somewhere where, you know, you can actually go on and on because uh, if you have either used Burp Suit, heard of it, or you know how powerful the suit is, it would really add value to your application and your candidature as well. But then understand this: Burp Suit is a very powerful, uh, you know, suit. It's a very powerful platform which provides a lot of tools. So at least mentioning five or six of these functionalities and tools will help you a lot. 
Coming to question number 23, it states, uh, what is SQL injection and what are the types of SQL injection? Well, one thing you really have to know is that uh, if you do not work on handling the user input in a very effective way, it will definitely lead to an SQL injection in one point or the other because uh, here what we're trying to do or what a hacker would eventually do is they would inject SQL queries uh, into the system, into the database and this will give them unauthorized access and with unauthorized access, they can do anything, right? So they can execute any sort of administrative operations that they want and uh, you know pick up data, delete data, modify data and they can, they can do everything that an administrator could do basically so this is sql injection so uh, you know there are many many types of sql injections but the three most popular one is error-based sql injection you have blind sql injection and of course time-based sql injection as well coming to question number 24 it states what is ssl and why is it not enough when it comes to encryption SSL is only used for identification, uh, you know, identity verification, and you really have to know this and this is how you should start the answer. Uh, you know, because with SSL, people think that it is hard encryption, that, you know, it is it is a barrier to hackers. Well, no, you know, with SSL, all you try to do is understand what goes on, uh, you know, what's the identity of the product that's uh, right in front of you. So with SSL, uh, how it's meant to be is to provide you a way that you can prove a person that's sitting, that's engaging on the other side whenever they say whoever they are because you know you cannot have imposters uh, have the SSL verification done too so in that particular case SSL and TLS right so these two are actually used by almost everyone online because uh, everyone who are present online is first of all a huge uh, a huge target and uh, you know uh, you know there's a lot of uh, implementation that gets goes on uh, that that goes on especially with SSL and TLS and at the end of the day the entire world knows how powerful uh, identity requirement identity verification is even before beginning any sort of valid or uh, invalid communication too. Now coming to question number 25, it states what programming language is used for hacking? Well, again, this is a very subjective question because depending on the requirement at that moment, maybe the project that you're working on, the company that you are being hired for, uh, they might ask any one of these five languages, be it Python, C, C++, Java, Perl, or Lisp. So having a bit of proficiency in all of these languages uh, will definitely help because, uh, you know, even though these are the most popular hacking languages that are present out there, each of these languages have their own niche applications and each of these have their own sort of best approaches we take towards programming and it is very educative, it's very informative and of course more the information the merrier in the world of ethical hacking, right? So considering all of that, it definitely helps to have a good amount of knowledge on Python, C, C++, Java, Perl and the working of Lisp as well. Coming to question number 26, uh, it's just what is the meaning of a spoofing attack? Uh, we've discussed this before, but let me reiterate on this because it's a very, very important question. You know, a spoofing attack is when a person tries to be someone that they are not. Of course, it can be done with malicious intent where a person tries to impersonate another uh, user, another device or whatever it is on the network. So they can use that as leverage to launch an attack on the network host. Uh, this is done to either steal the data, to uh, bypass access controls, to, uh, to basically wreak havoc in the network. And then, you know, there are many, many types of spoofing attacks it gets deployed uh, to achieve the end result whatever it is the end result may be stealing the data uh, you know having a denial of service later on or having uh, access which is undetected and a lot more things too Coming to question number 27, it states, what are the different types of spoofing? This this definitely can be a follow-up question to the 26th question, but you have to understand that there's three types of spoofing that happens. Uh, we have the ARP spoofing, we have DNS spoofing, and of course, the most popular we have is IP spoofing attacks that takes place. So whenever you ask this question, you can talk about these three uh, spoofing attacks that are there. Coming to question number 28, uh, it says, what is active and passive reconnaissance? See, whenever we talk about active and passive, as the name suggests, there is something that has to do with uh, participation, right? See, with passive reconnaissance, what we're trying to do is we're trying to gain information regarding uh, the targeted computers or the targeted networks without having to participate right then and there or to actively monitor it. Now, what happens in active reconnaissance is that whenever, uh, you know, the hacker actually engages uh, the target system, uh, uh, you know, you can, you'll actually be performing a task there that that's the active part of it you know you can be uh, you can be doing a port scan you can be doing a lot of network scan you can be doing vulnerability analysis you can be doing pen testing so when you're doing this kind of a reconnaissance step where you're actively participating to sit and find out where there's a vulnerability or uh, find out where you can uh, you know access the system through that is active reconnaissance and the difference between uh, passive reconnaissance as well 
Now coming to the 29th question, it says differentiate between a MAC and an IP address. See, MAC stands for Machine Access Control. This is an address that gets assigned to each device that is present on a network. Your mobile phone will have a MAC address. Your computer will have a MAC address. Uh, you know, any any device that basically has the capability to talk to uh, the internet or a network gets a MAC assigned uh, to it. So whenever we talk about IP addresses, right? So IP addresses are these uh, way of uh, distinguishing two devices in between, uh, you know, in, in the same network work or on a different network as well so whenever you have the capability to say yes this is the machine that's connected uh, you know you know th through the network and then yes this is the IP address through which you can have a personal gateway to that particular machine on the network and provide uh, valid identification to the router that uh, is uh, IP address as well so the MAC address cannot be changed but the IP address definitely can be now coming to the 30th question uh, it says have you earned any sort of certification to improve your learning and implementation process see be it in the field of ethical hacking be it in the field of uh, you know anything in the world of technology right a certification is going to add a lot of value to your career uh, you know in terms of learning in terms of you being trained by industry level experts in terms of you being uh, hands on working with industry level projects uh, job prospects uh, basically a wealth of knowledge a lot more things i'm sure if you're at this point of time you would know that a certification would uh, you know add extreme amounts of value to your career and learning right but what does it do to the interviewer well the interviewer will know that you know you are very interested in a career in ethical hacking if you're certified here because it shows that you've put in your time your money your efforts and your dedication to become an expert into that so that shows that you have a strong aspiration a passion towards ethical hacking and of course if you've done this through a certification program it means that you are willing to put your time down to learn something new to work on it and this uh, in in a team player environment in an actual production environment will mean a lot to the company and that is exactly what the interviewer will be looking forward to as well. So my suggestion whenever you're answering this question is to of course talk about what certifications you've cleared, what examinations, what programs you've been enrolled to and all of that. Once uh, you've, you've spoken about what the certification programs are, do not nag a lot about it, but rather talk about how you've used it. See, anything in the concept of cybersecurity or anything in, in the field of IT in general is used to solve a problem that is making the human life difficult. So, so what problem have you solved after you have been certified or after you being an expert into it? So have you thought about a solution to a problem that doesn't exist or have you solved a problem uh, you know, in a different way? than someone else as well so talk about the practical aspect because that is where all the heart of the uh, you know heart of an ethical hacker uh, definitely lies and so you can answer this in many ways i would definitely suggest you guys uh, use this we hope this session was very informative for you all if you have any questions any comments or any feedback make sure to head down to the comment section and do let us know we'll be more than happy to help you there well guys with this i hope all of you are keeping safe i wish you well and i'm more than excited to see you on the next one <laughs>